Okay, here we go. Jeez. Every time. Every time. Okay. Um, here we go. So we begin in chapter 18, verse 23. And Paul ended his second missionary trip. Uh, that's what you guys read yesterday. Okay, we all read that yesterday. And um, when he had, just to sort of recap on the very end, he had wanted to go to Ephesus and the spirit two years before he made it to Ephesus, two years before that he had wanted to go to Ephesus and the spirit forbade him. Okay. It was actually Asia, which Ephesus is in Asia. So there's all these places that he went to. Uh, that you guys read at the end of yesterday that he had tried to get to two years prior to this, but the Holy Spirit forbade him. And it just is speaking about a special timing for everything. Paul would make it there. In fact, you guys should know that Paul, he spent three years in Ephesus total, maybe even a little more than that. Um, as these men of faith, as they would go on these missionary journeys and as they would spend time, you know, he spent like a year and a half in Corinth. He spent two weeks in Thessalonica, three years in Ephesus. And so there's background to all of these towns and cities that he's going to, you know, we read about it in one chapter, but really years have gone by just since chapter 16 to chapter 18. And, um, on this same note, chapter 18 and 19 cover a span of three years. Okay. And so Paul's going to spend three years at Ephesus. So that's going to be important to know a little bit later and to come back to that as we get into the study. But sometimes when the Holy Spirit forbids us to go in a direction, um, it's not him saying no, it's him saying wait, or it's him saying later. And I mean, it could be him straight up saying no, but the Lord will work out all those details for our lives. And there is a timing for things. So Paul, um, he had left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus and he finished his second missionary trip and ended up in Antioch. And um, then in verse 23, where we pick up today, it says, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all of the disciples. And so this is the area of um, Asia where he ends up in Ephesus again. So, we break from verse 23 till chapter 19. And you see this young man come in, Apollos. You see this guy get introduced to us. And um, we come back to Paul. The interesting thing is that as Paul you know, left Ephesus, Apollos came in. He meets Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul goes you know, to Jerusalem and does his thing. And, and then when Paul comes back to Ephesus, Apollos ends up in Corinth. Okay. And I know that's like a lot to remember. And through the years, you might get some of that stuff down. I know in the beginning, it can be confusing, but it's important just to know that these men were working hand in hand and they were, one was planting and one was watering. And we're going to look at those scriptures in a minute. So, okay, let's look at verse 24 and a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, proved to be of great benefit or helped them much with what had believed through grace with those that had believed. For he mightily convinced the Jews and publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So... Um, 
Apollos, the scriptures, this account tells us a lot about him. He was eloquent. What that means is that he was a good speaker. Okay. He was, he was able to communicate well. He was a very good communicator and mighty in the scriptures. His knowledge, however, was not expanded. Like he, he had, um, some faults in that he needed to know more. Okay. The things he knew were accurate and he had giftings. This is a very cool guy because God made this man with an ability to speak. Okay. He's got the gift of speech. He's eloquent and he's mighty. He's persuasive. And so, but you can see he lacked, he lacked some understanding and he lacked some knowledge. You can also tell something about him that's not out and out mentioned here, but he's humble. Apollos shows humility because when Aquila and Priscilla heard him and they could, you know, they heard the things he was saying, they saw his giftings, they brought him under their wing and they expounded to him more accurately the things of the Lord. And this is what Apollos needed. And we need each other. God might have gifted you with an ability for speech or for caring for people. There's lots of gifts that are mentioned in the scriptures. If you guys didn't know that, you can read about them in 1 Corinthians, like chapters 11, 12, and 13, and 14. Um, but you can also read about them in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 are motivational gifts. Okay, so what a what a motivational gift is, is a gift that motivates you for being in ministry. It's why you're in ministry. And then the ones that are in Corinthians, those are giftings that you may have on occasion. God might gift you with the word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or, you know, this and that. And so those are gifts that you could have once and never again or on multiple occasions, but they are at work. The spirit is at work with those gifts. So he's gifted um, and he shows humility by, you know, he's teachable by being teachable. And this is an important trait to have as a disciple of Christ, that you remain teachable, not just while you're in the program, not just while you're in basic or before you're in the working phase, but you need to remain teachable your whole walk, okay? Because we're never going to attain. And I'm still learning to almost 20 years later, I'm still learning so much. It's very important that we have a teachable spirit. When you have a teachable spirit, there will be results, so there's results to every choice we make. And one of the results of having a teachable spirit is that he was able to be of great benefit to people. Okay, you guys see that in the scriptures. He, um, you know, Aquila Aqu and Priscilla should be commended too because they see this man. They don't view him as a threat. They expound the scriptures to him more and that he is given what he needs so that he can go and be a benefit to people. And so that was one of the results is that people were benefited, right? That's a huge result. That's, that's what we want to do. We want to equip people. We want people to grow in the Lord. And so we want to be truth speakers and we want to hold people accountable to God's word. And we want to teach the scriptures and we want to share God's heart with people so that they can get to know him more. So Apollos is a cool cat. And um, so he, this had all taken place in Ephesus while Paul is not in Ephesus at this time. And you guys will hear about Apollos later on in first Corinthians. We could go look at that. Everybody go to first Corinthians chapter three. And um, you know, Paul and Peter were, the, you know, they were the muscles of the day, Christians speak, and, you know, what I mean, like they were the leaders. And um, Apollos was clearly gifted and got raised up and God was using him. And you're going to read in chapter 19 that once Apollos left Ephesus, he goes to Corinth. And Paul had already been in Corinth. And so when you see the men coming in and out on these missionary trips, um, something can often take place in Christianity as it did then and as it can today, 
that I think we need to take a look at because in first Corinthians 13, if you guys don't know this about Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians is a correction letter that Paul wrote to that church and they were corrected on multiple things from sexual immorality to idolatry to, you know, the misuse of the gifts of the spirit. Um, they were corrected on, um, what's called sectarianism, which is what we're going to address here in first Corinthians three. It's a divisiveness. It's a having favorites, if you will, not that you can't have a favorite teacher, but when you have a favorite teacher so that it causes you to be divided, then that's straight up wrong. So in first Corinthians three, Paul had said in verse two, you know, or verse one and two, I got to speak to you as carnal, like you're a babe in Christ still. And then he's like, goes on in verse three and he's addressing the envy and the strife and the divisions. And then in verse four, he says, one says I'm of Paul. And another says, well, I'm of Apollos. And he's like, the people saying that, are you not carnal? Like that's worldly. Um, you know, and so he goes on and he's just explaining to them, listen, who am I and who is Apollos? We're both just ministers and God's given to each of us gifts and we're using them. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. And then later in first Corinthians three, Paul, you know, verse 22, Paul even says, whether Paul, Apollos or Cephas. And so it's kind of cool because Apollos is getting mentioned among Paul and Peter and so this young, this man had gotten raised up and he was very gifted, but the, the cities that the apostles were going to, they were getting spoiled really. And with these men, like, can you imagine living in the day of Peter and, and Paul and they would come and visit your church? And so sectarianism was taking place and that this division was taking place. And so Paul would really correct that. Um, in first Corinthians chapter three. And so it's something that we should be aware of. I mean, you could take a, like even, um, you know, Peggy, Lauren and I, and the other leaders of the programs that I think sometimes um, come into these things, you know, like we're all just serving the Lord and you can have a favorite. I think, I hope my girls are my favorite. I mean, I hope I'm my girl's favorite <laughs> is what I'm saying, but everybody can have their favorite. We can represent but we're just sort of in good fun, you know, like we shouldn't do things to a point of division and the division doesn't belong in the body of Christ. Okay. We're just disciples making other disciples, training up women as we were and working hand in hand with one another. But that would be an example. Okay. So let's go back into Acts, loving Apollos. He's teachable, loving Aquila and Priscilla who are just this mom and dad figure in the faith to him where they bring him in and they add to him so that he can then go add to others. And there will be people like this in your ministry. If there's leaders listening today, you know, like just like with a mom who desires her children to do better than she did. Um, you know, there will be people that you that the Lord is going to go and use. I, I can look at some of the women that have come through Blessed Hope in the past 10 years. And I'm just amazed at, like whenever I go to East Coast Pastors Wives, I just makes me cry to look at how many pastors wives are there. Um, and so you just want to give people what would better equip them for the ministry that the Lord will have before them. Okay, so chapter 19, the baptism of John's disciples. Um, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, we have not so much heard of whether there's a Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is what he, this is what he's talking about. So he says to them in verse three, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John did baptize with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. 
When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there was about 12 men. So this is a sweet thing that takes place when Paul comes to Ephesus. A work had started in Ephesus. Um, you know, Paul wanted Aquila and Priscilla to stay there. They wanted Paul to tarry there with them. He said, Lord willing, I'll be back. And he was back. And so I don't want to, you know, be too, I don't want to take from tomorrow's teaching, but the three years that Paul is going to spend in Ephesus, what we see right here happen is he's, you know, he's building the foundation, okay, which is Jesus and people being baptized in the name of Jesus and then getting saved and the Holy Spirit coming upon their lives. And the Holy Spirit is um, a part of the Trinity that gets overlooked a lot. Some people have had weird experiences with the Holy Spirit or just none at all. And it just sounds weird. I remember, you know, just thinking Holy Spirit, just those two words sounded weird, <laughs> you know? Like the word flesh sounded weird to me when I was brand new. And so people were saying my flesh, this or my flesh, that or my flesh needs to die. And I just thought that was a really weird word. Um, not so much anymore, but I just, people have either not had experiences with the Holy Spirit or have had weird ones. And the Holy Spirit is who you and I have today. It is who Jesus sent to be with us. When he, that was the promise, he said, when well, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the comforter. So the Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's one of the workings of the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher. And the book of John talks a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the gift giver. It is that he gives gifts as the spirit wills. And so I would encourage you guys to, um, you know, really look at the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's working in your lives and pray for a fresh feeling, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus into your lives, when you repent from your sins and receive Christ and, you know, repentance is that change of lifestyle and you're walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And prior to that, he's outside convicting you. The Holy Spirit's job is conviction. He convicts the world of sin. And then there's salvation and he lives in you. And then he comes upon you. And so you can ask for a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see took place here today when Paul laid their hands on on the 12 men that were there as they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it came upon them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Those are two different things, tongues and prophecy. Tongues is not prophecy. Um, it is a prayer language. Okay, so those are, you can read more about those things in 1 Corinthians, about those giftings of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, um, like you don't want to do this walk without the Holy Spirit because then it would be very hard. And we have a blessing in Christ through the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the, there was 12 men in all. And in verse 8, it says that he then went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of about three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So what is Paul talking about? He's in the synagogue. And for these initial three months of his stay there, he's disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God, heaven. Paul's eternally minded and he's talking about God's kingdom and he's talking about Jesus's return. And he's talking about the scriptures and, um, what took place is it took three months to reveal the people that the hard heartedness. So in verse nine, it says when, but when um, diverse were hardened, that's like many people, when there was a group of people that were stubborn or hardened and they rejected the things that Paul spoke of and they spoke evil of that way before the multitude. So there were some, there was a group of people who were stubborn, hard hearted, and they rejected the message. And so 
I do believe that division is one of the markings of rejection, not like learning how to get along, not like learning how to die to ourselves. And that, you know, in the program, you guys are learning that like program 101, right? Living with other people, learning how to let somebody else have the first cup of coffee or the first shower, or the front seat of the vehicle, and just learning those dying to ourselves or when personalities sort of butt heads and there's a little division and you're really learning how to have the heart of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, you know, that kind of stuff. But when there is division, when there is being speaking evil of um, the work of the Lord and specifically, you know, Paul's message was under attack and it was being spread. Okay. You can read in verse nine that people, this group of people whose hearts were hardened. So there's stubbornness, rebellion, there's rejection of the Lord, and they're speaking evil before the multitude. Okay. So um, this is not good. And he departed from them and he separated the disciples. So you see this take place and you see Paul's reaction. And so again, if there's people in leadership listening, somebody who's shepherding sheep, you know, it is important that you look out for division and that you really help get it under control, especially when um, the criticism, like those are seeds that get planted in people's hearts. And I have seen terrible things take place from one or two people's mouths that didn't get stopped. Um, and so it is um, very important to look at what Paul did here. It says that he departed from them and he separated the disciples too. He called the disciples away. So let's take a look at some other scriptures that talk about this. Titus 3.10. says what? It says, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Yes. Okay. And actually, sorry, I should have had you read the next verse too. Can you read the next verse right after that one? Yes, ma'am. Um, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Okay. Thank you. So Titus had said, listen, after a first and second correction, reject a divisive person, like stay away. All right. Because that person is warped and sinning and condemns themselves. And it has an effect on people around. First Corinthians 15, 33 also says. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrupts good character. Okay, great. Thank you. I will just read my version. It says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Okay. So um, it's important to point out that this is after three months that Paul spent disputing and persuading and talking about the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes you know, things don't become known right away. And um, as the word of God gets taught and as the word of God gets planted and as it gets watered and, you know, to be faithfully preaching and teaching the word of God and faithfully walking this out, then eventually you're going to see some things take place. You're going to see people not respond well, and you're going to see people grow. And, um, Paul, after like another two years goes by, I don't know if this is in my section today. I actually don't remember reading it, but I know from memory that, you know, another two years goes by and what you guys are going to read tomorrow is insane. Okay. Paul spent three years here laboring the word of God, disputing, talking about the kingdom of heaven. And eventually the effect that it had, remember I was talking about results and how your choices have results. Well, there is going to be results in your life from being in God's word and from, and for people who are actively sharing the word of God, you might not see results right away, but what we see in this chapter is that 
businessman, like the way that Paul preached faithfully for three years ended up affecting the economy. Hands down, I wish this would happen in America. And yet we've seen pastors across the nation be on this whole American renewal project. We've seen pastors, our pastor is a big part of this, where he's going to other churches, just trying to get pastors to return to expositionally teaching the word of God, the whole word of God, just teach the word of God, all of it, cover to cover. Okay. And so front to back. And there will be results from this. I do believe that, you know, Jesus is coming soon, very soon. Um, but I, I actually am pretty convinced that there's going to be revival. And I'm not talking about like America necessar necess um, necessarily. I mean, it would be amazing if we could change and sort of um, have some revived um, morals in this country. But just Christians, okay? Like, I'm just talking about Christianity. It's going to be amazing what takes place. And hardship is good for Christianity. And so, and we see that. We see even in the Calvary Chapel movement that it's been winnowed. And after Chuck Smith passed, we even saw um, things get winnowed and separated amongst the movement, okay? And that's not a bad thing at all. It's never a bad thing. Um, and so... There's a purification that takes place that is, you know, on, you know, on the outside looking in, you might think, oh no, like people are falling away or people are believing other things. And it's just like, you know, this is good because the church is being purified and that's what we want. And so what the results that, um, came from Paul's faithful preaching there in Ephesus was you guys will read tomorrow about, um, you know, Princess Diana, people were repenting, okay? Repentance took place. And so there is faithful teaching and then there's repentance. And then from repentance comes revival. And one person's heart, okay? Revival spreads one person to one person. Like you can be revived. You can be on fire for Christ. And that happens first you know, repentance happens and then revival is the result of that, a revived life. So, um, oh, it was in my reading. It was verse 10 <laughs> and this continued for about two years. Okay. It says, and this continued by, by the space of about two years so that all they, which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul's preaching took place. And so don't be discouraged if you are not seeing results right away. God's word says, don't grow weary in well-doing, okay? Because you will reap if you don't lose heart. And when you take a look at your personal life, you can do a little inventory, do a little check and say, listen, it didn't take me one week to mess my life up. It took maybe three years, maybe six years, maybe for some of you, it was 12 years. And so when you do that, you could see how your choices, they were leading you down a path, but you didn't get to the end until like your life was wherever it was for different women. I know sometimes people have been stopped in their tracks before it got too long by the grace of God. Um, but the point is, is that it didn't happen overnight. And so we come to Christ and we we still have this drug addict mentality of immediate gratification. We want results and we want results now. Well, that's not always the way. That's not how God works. And God is into us learning patience and learning grace. And he's into us um, being faithful and continuing simply because of him. And then there will be results from faithfully being in the word of God and walking this out. So that's, I love that. I think most as like a bird's eye view um, into chapter 19, when you have this bird's eye view of what's taking place with these men traveling and going to different places and just knowing that chapter 19 covers a span of about three years um, that Paul had been there and the results that take place is this crazy revival that challenges the economy there in Ephesus. Okay. That is what we would love to see happen today. So, um, 
just on the subject of revival, um, <clears throat> before I go on and finish up, like I, I we, I do want to go to first Samuel 14. This is something that, you know, the Lord was speaking to me this morning, just about repentance and revival and just having his bird's eye view of what's taking place. Like, you know, you, um, you can be sharing the word with somebody. Maybe this is for a mom that's in the program where you have a kid that just, you don't think is hearing anything or a husband, or maybe it's been you at one point in your life and you just don't think anything's going on or anything's happening and you just need to keep going. Okay. Like you just have to keep on doing it because um, you don't know what's going on in the, on the inside of somebody's heart and you don't know what your faithful planting will, like you don't know the future. As a farmer, I can speak to this huge, like my faith has never been tested as much as with farming. Like we, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the saying, make hay while the sun shines. Well, that's legit when farmers make hay, like it can't rain. Like our crops, we can't afford to feed our cows. We can't buy hay. We have to cut our fields. Okay. This is have some spiritual application in a minute. So we have to have three days of sunshine and it can't rain or our crop is destroyed. Your hay can't mold. It can't be wet. And so you have to and it's not something that you can cut your field and bale it in one day. It has to take place in three days because you have to cut it. Then you have to spread it and you have to let the sun dry it from green to like that brownish color that hay is. Okay. And there's this process. And so when you don't have control over the seasons, it's a real crazy thing. And so there's this faith that gets sort of forced or practiced of really just trusting the Lord. And um, so like no matter what season of life you're in, you know, you just be faithful each step of the way and you don't know what God's going to do. Like God is, we're working with the Lord. We get to work with the Holy Spirit. Um, he's the one doing the work and the work that we do is very important. Like you have to show up, you get up and you read your Bible and, but God, as we do these things obediently unto him, God's doing a work. So, you know, if you're a mom or if you're a wife, like I just remember reading, it was actually on May 13th, it's, but it's first Samuel 14 that I want to talk about. Um, Sometimes we think, I don't know about you, but like whenever I hear teachings on revival, I just get so excited and I'm like, Lord, I just want to go do something really big, right? <laughs> or whatever. So I hope you guys get what I'm saying. Like I keep trying to come back to revival is something I believe is going to take place, but you have to see it came out of the fruit of day to day doing. Do you guys get that? Can I, like, is that, am I communicating that clearly enough? The revival that you guys are going to read about tomorrow took daily for Paul three years preaching. Okay. So that's really what I'm trying to get you guys to understand. And then in first Samuel 14, there's just this other example that complements what I'm trying to say. So first one, um, begins. One day, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Jonathan was Saul's son, just in case nobody knows that. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of, Ge of um, Gebeah around the pomegranate tree at, at Megron. So this is Jonathan and his armor bearer. Just please take note of that. This is two men, Jonathan and his armor bearer. And Saul, who's king, he's camped out. He's actually under a tree chilling with 600 men. 
And so then if you jump to verse six, um, Jonathan says, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. Uh Oh, something just happened. Okay, here we go. Um, sorry, let me say that again. Let us go across the outposts of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or few. So again, just take note. He's all like many warriors or few. And sometimes we think revival like we need a whole bunch of people, but there was two of them. Okay. His armor bearer's response, if everybody could look at verse 7. The response was, do what you think is best. The armor bearer replied, I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Do all that's in your heart. I'm behind you. Ladies, what we're about to read is we're going to read some things that the Lord had spoken to me about revival and all of it. Like, I don't think what's about to take place and what we're going to read in this huge victory for the Israelites like it might have been in Jonathan's mind, it might have been his idea, but the armor bearer who doesn't have a name, who we don't know, was simply behind him. Okay, so he was simply supportive and he said, do all that's in your heart, I'm with you. That was the response of the armor bearer. And so then um, in verse 12, men see them coming and they're like, come up here. We're going to teach you a lesson. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, come on, climb right behind me. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, for the Lord will help us defeat them. So they climbed up using both hands and feet and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed those who came behind them. Please step in and picture. Jonathan is going up on his hands and feet, climbing up and he's killing those before him. And it says the armor bearer killed those who came behind them. How are they fighting? They're fighting back to back. Okay. These two people, they're fighting back to back. And so they killed 20 men. That's what they killed. But you see this unity between them and they kill 20 men. And all of a sudden panic breaks out in verse 15. And so then there's panic. Then there's an earthquake, which was the Lord. And so then in verse 16, Saul's lookout, okay, they see the strange sight and the vast army of the Philistines began to melt away in every direction. So you see the enemy just start to melt away. Saul's like, who's missing? They, they figure out it's your son and his armor bearer. So then Saul's like, okay, bring the ephod here. Let's figure out what we should do. What we should do. Let's ask the Lord. But while Saul's talking to the priest in verse 19, the confusion in the Philistine camp is growing louder and louder. So Saul's just lingering. He's like, what should we do? Who's missing? And then what's taking place in the Philistine camp is growing so loud that Saul finally says, never mind, let's get going. And so he finally joins the battle. Okay. And so in verse 20, his men rush out to battle and they found the Philistines killing each other. And there's all this confusion. 21, even the Hebrews who had previously gone over to the Philistine army revolted and joined in with Saul and Jonathan. That's a picture of repentance. People who were the Lord's but were on the enemy's side. Okay, they were on the wrong side fighting for the wrong team. So all of the this little action by Jonathan and his armor bearer got Saul motivated to join in. Then all of a sudden, the Hebrews who were on the enemy's side, they revolt and join with Saul and Jonathan. Then you see even more in 22. Likewise, the men of Israel who were hiding in the hill country of Ephraim, they joined the chase. Those who had not yet professed Christ, who had not really stepped out and, and identified with Christ, they come. And you see all this sort of chaos and you see this repentance and you see the Hebrews like, oh, no, we're on the wrong side. Let's go. Let's you know, fight with them and those that were hiding. And it all started out with these two men. 
And again, I just think a lot of it, the armor bearer who had said, I'm with you, who trusted in his leadership. So like when we go back into acts, just how that ties in is these men, they were working together. You know, they, they were working hands in hand back to back. They, um, and planting and watering, like I mentioned, and like we went and read in first Corinthians chapter three and, um, for people who, you know, it's like revival's exciting. It's exciting to think about. I get excited, but it comes about by the day to day obedience. Like I, in my life, just being behind my husband. Okay. Whatever's in your heart. And I'm telling you, this is hard because I'll tell you about last night. Okay. We have barn cats and they're like 10 weeks old and they're not our pets. And we tr are trying to get a hold for them. But one of them went across the road and we just had a cat. My daughter's cat got hit by a car and died. So when Adam went and rescued the cat from across the road, he said, that's it. The cats are sleeping inside tonight. Well, I don't want them to. I don't want the barn cats. They're not trained to go in a litter box. And so I'm disgruntled. And then I'm just like, whatever. And I know that might seem silly, but it's not. Okay. Because we think like, you know, my attitude, my kids see it, they get to see these things. And it's like, why I want to be Jonathan's armor bear. Like I want to be whatever's in your heart. I'm behind you. Let's do it. And eventually that's where I got to. But that's what I want to be when Jonathan says, hey, let's go up and let's just see the Philistines. Jonathan's armor bearer wasn't like, what are you crazy? Like, I'm a what are you crazy person because I'm kind of like a Philip where I do the math when Jesus says, hey, how are we going to feed these people? I'm like doing the math. And so, you know, to be more just faith oriented and say, yeah, let's do it. Like, let's go up. I'm behind you. So these are the day to day things that do lead to us growing. And as we teach and as we apply and as we study, things take place in our hearts and in the lives of the people around us. And then we will see results. Okay. I promise you guys, you're going to see results in your life as you simply do the things that are before you each day, even if you think they're silly. Okay. So, um, verse 11 says that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Oh, I think that's it. That's where we end. Okay. So that's kind of a blunt place to end, but yes. Yeah, so Paul was working um, all of these miracles as well. Like that's kind of crazy. And Jesus actually said, listen, if you believe in me, you're going to actually do even more miracles than I did some crazy ones. And so that's cool because it, Paul didn't even have to be present. He could just take a handkerchief or an apron and diseases would depart from people. So there's some cool works that are accompanying his speech and the things that he was saying and teaching of the word of God. Okay. So I hope you guys were blessed. I know I was this morning when I was with Jesus um, does anybody desire to share? Or I don't know if Peggy ever showed up. <laughs>